Thanks for coming along. Um, I don't know if you know who I am or what I've done and what I do for a living, but um, I'm a freelance producer and engineer. Um, I come from a completely engineering background, trained at a studio, and now I'm freelance. So um, if anyone wants to ask me any questions at any point, just feel free or jot them down and then we'll do some question answer stuff. When I found, I got interested in music. When I was at school, I loved listening to music and I loved records and I used to go out and buy vinyl records on my weekends and with pocket money and buy things, got really into it. But I was far more interested, rather than playing, I got really into how the records were made and how records sounded different and the fact that um, they were done at different studios and I was reading all the credits. And it always fascinated me. And then I was fortunate enough that when I was at school, secondary school, in the summer holidays, they had some various courses you could go on. So if you're into drama, you could go and do drama. If you're into music as a player, you could go and meet up with some guys from another school and they put you together, give you a day in a little studio and you do a demo. There was another one and it was called a recording workshop. And I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. So I went along and it was a little jingle studio, very basic. Um, they had an eight track reel to reel machine and a small drum machine and a few instruments lying around. And our project for the week was to make a jingle for a made up radio station and I was fascinated by it, the fact that you had this multi-track machine and whereas before everything you record like on your cassette recorder whenever you tried it, it's in stereo, now you could multi-track. So we put a drum machine down and we built it up and then the fact we could bring it back through the little console they had and then mix it and balance it and make it all sound good, it, I was really fascinated by it. So I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind doing this for a living. So um, when it came to careers time at school, we'd all have a meetings with the careers officer and I asked my careers officer, I said, oh, I'd love to go and work in a recording studio. And he shook his head and said, no way, unless you know someone at the BBC or you have family there, it's a close job, you'll never get to do anything like that. So I was kind of like, oh, okay. And I was a bit shocked and I, I looked in a few other places and I went to the outside careers officer outside of school and different places and same sort of thing. And then uh, by chance, I was working on Saturdays in a sports shop to get some pocket money. And my summer holidays were coming up before I had to go back and do my A-levels. And I, I wanted to earn some money. So I said to the guy in the shop, I said, oh, any chance um, you could give me six weeks work? Do you need me in the week kind of thing? He said, no, we're not busy enough. I said, oh, I said, just really need to get some work through the summer. And he said, well, there's a woman that comes, you like music, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, there's a woman that comes in here and she works at some studio place around the corner. He said, I'll have a word when she comes in. And then she came in a couple of Saturdays later. And um, she said, oh yeah, I work for a studio around the corner. If, any, if we think of anything, I'll give you a call. I didn't hold out much hope. And then a week after that, I got a call from a woman at Virgin Records. Turns out that Virgin Records own the studio and they keep all their tapes there and they were about to relocate them. So she said, I wonder, it's not very glamorous, but do you fancy going there? It's about four weeks work. We'll pay you cash, you know, get some pocket money. And um, you just have to catalogue all the tapes, make lists and then bring them up to us in Labrook Grove where our offices are. So um, I said, great, yeah, because I needed the work. So I went and did it. And in cataloguing all the tapes, I found that you had two inch tapes, half inch tapes. So I got to learn about what, what the differences were. And I met all the people at the studio. And then um, it was I, I finished, it went on about an extra week, which was great, because it took me to the end of my summer holidays. I went back to school, chose my A-levels on the first day. When I got back, um, there was a message for me to go and see the woman, another woman from the studio who was the big boss. And at first I thought, oh, I must have done something wrong and I'm gonna get some, in some grief here. And I went along and she said, look, um, we liked having you around, you were really good, you got on with everybody, would you like to come and work here? I'm thinking of starting a young trainee guy, instead of in the studio side of it, in the disc cutting side. And I'd met the disc cutting guys and they were great guys and, and what they do is great, but I found it a bit boring and it wasn't for me. So I said to her, well, it's not really what I want to do, I'm afraid. I said, uh, I have sat in and, and it's interesting, I said, but it's not really for me. And she said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to be a tape op, you know, an assistant engineer. I'd love to be a, a recording engineer. She said, all right. She said, well, we'll give you a month's trial. If it works out and you hack it, we'll keep you on. So I had a little think about it. I thought, well, it's a, it's a good studio. It was uh, Townhouse Studios, which was owned by Virgin. I had a lot of great people coming in at the time. So um, I weighed it up and thought, well, if it doesn't work out, I can go and do A-levels anywhere. But if I go and do A-levels and still want to do this, I probably won't be able to walk into a job here. So I decided to do it. So um, I started there as at the time, it was called a tape operator, tape op for short. Um, it's, now it's called more assistant engineer. Um, the reason it was called tape operator is because we all worked on two-inch tape, which I presume most of you are doing audio in some form in your course, right? 
So have you worked with two-inch tape before and tape machines? So this is a multi-track tape machine for recording onto. It has 24 tracks and all the separate instruments will get recorded onto the tracks. This sits at the back of the room and they, it was before they had remote controls and before desks like SSLs that were designed with the central centre section that controls everything, it was at the back. So your job was to control it. So you'd have to mark the front of the song somewhere with a piece of china graph here and zero your clock, run it through and make notes so and get timings for each section of the song and cue points, four bars before each section. And the producer would yell out, OK, uh, we're going to drop in a lead guitar on the second chorus. So you'd have to know on the clock where four, eight bars, whatever you wanted, was before it. And he'd say, right, I'm going to play from eight bars before. You'd play. And the guitarist would know he's got eight bars to come in. And then you'd drop it in. And then the producer or engineer might turn around and say, OK, that was great. Just drop in for the last two bars of it. We're going to do it again. And you'd have to operate the tape machine. And um, it was quite nervy at times because there's no undo button on a tape machine. So if you drop in in the wrong place or if you forget to drop out, it's gone forever. No undo whatsoever. So um, it's, you had to keep on, on the case. And if you weren't sure, just stop and ask. A couple of times you think, oh, I think he meant that, and you do it, and then you get shouted at, and you don't do it again. Um, and it was treated like an apprenticeship. So the studio, at the time, there was, there was very few courses. There weren't colleges like the SAE about. There was one course available at, I think it was Guildford University, called the Tom Meister course. And it was very much about um, musical composition, arrangement, and they did touch a bit on, on the technology side of it and recording studios. But it was taught by academic people and teachers, which, no disrespect to them, they were all great, but they'd never worked in a studio. So all the big studios, whenever someone applied for a job, I want to be a tape operator, I've just got a degree at the Tom Meister course, they'd throw it straight in the bin. Because they didn't want someone who'd been taught how, how they thought it worked in a studio to come and work in their studio. They'd rather have someone who knew nothing and teach them from the ground up. So. Um, you would start off and first of all you'd have to what they call double assist. So you'd be with another tape operator watching what he does. Um, there'd be an in-house engineer and the producer and the band. And then uh, as, they built, as you built up some trust with the, with the studio and they check your competency, you'd be allowed to tape operate on your own with an in-house engineer. And then gradually you'd be able to tape up on your own with a freelance engineer normally the first couple of times someone who's been in before that the studio have a bit of a relationship with so that if, if they feel that you weren't quite up to it they'd find out and nothing bad would go wrong because mm -hmm. at the end of the day you're the ambassador for the studio you're spending probably anywhere between 10 and 16 hours a day with these people so it's important that that you you look after the client well and you do a good job because you're the representative for the studio and you spend the most time with the client even though the big boss is doing all the deals you're the one spending all the time with them so you, I gradually went from being a tape operator to an in-house engineer. Um, it was a great time at the townhouse. They worked us very hard. They had a very high standard. So if ever a tape op left, it took for them forever to find someone else. So we were always, whenever that happened, we were always gutted because we knew we would only get a day off if someone didn't book the studio. And they were generally booked seven days a week. So, you know, it was quite feasible to go two or three months without a day off if, if the studio was completely booked. And the worst thing is if somebody was coming in for two or three days and there was someone in the day after, because they would want their money's worth and they'd work all night and then the next lot come in nice and early, so you'd miss out on, on your sleep.